Almost 2,000 years ago, that first Palm Sunday was the only time Jesus allowed himself to be announced and proclaimed openly as the King of Israel. This was to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah given about 500 years before. What kind of king were the people expecting? A conquering warrior king like David who would defeat the Romans. But what kind of king was really needed? A humble king who came to defeat Satan and sin and death and bring peace between God and mankind. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. may be seated. Thank you, praise team, for sharing the joy of this particular Sunday with us. This is Palm Sunday, the day in which our Savior experienced the greatest degree of adulation he would ever know this side of the cross. Of course, within five days, that would change dramatically. And the folks who led this train of procession would be fleeing out the back instead. But there were exceptions, remarkable exceptions, including one who we'll describe a little bit later in our worship time today. 
But for now, I do invite you to join me in the worship of a Savior who received both cheers and jeers with equanimity, knowing that both were needed to bring us salvation from the cross. Please stand. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Thank you. 
You may be seated. At this time, I'll invite the children to come forward as I have a word for them. And as they're coming, I will ask the adults to pass the friendship pads found next to the center aisles. A couple of weeks ago here in church, I introduced you to two fish. You can see their pictures there, sort of. One of them is um, what I would call floppy. He's kind of sick, not too well. The other is what I'd call flippy, tail flapping, feeling healthy, doing really, really well. And you actually got to make some fish in Sunday school a while back. At least several of you do. I hope you got to paint it. And what we learned a couple of weeks ago is that one of those fish was doing really, really well. And one of those fish wasn't doing very well at all. He was kind of sick. He was kind of gray, he was kind of sad, just not looking good at all. Do any of you remember why he wasn't feeling good at all? Yep. He was hungry, you're right. He was so hungry. Fish need food just like people do. But something happened in the last couple of weeks. You know what it is? Some child from our church who realized how hungry Floppy was, began to feed him. And when they began to feed him, he felt so much better. His color got better. He has a smile on his face. And you know, there's one way we know he's been fed. You know what it is? That's right. There's coins in there. There's coins in there. And that's really good. And what's even better is that within one week, one week from today, some of you brought your coin banks, which is awesome, and I hope they're full, but if they're not, within one week from today, you got another chance, just one week left, we're gonna take all the money that's in our coin banks, and we're gonna use it not to feed fish, but to feed families who are hungry. Families with children, both in our country and in other parts of the world, we do this every year on Easter Sunday, and so, what I'm going to ask all of you to do, just in case you forgot, maybe, and your fish banks are still kind of empty and kind of full, this week, this week, one more chance. If you don't have a coin bank, you can get it in Sunday school. If you do have a coin bank, see if you can fill it up. Um, there's actually lots of people here today who might help. If you come find them after church and, like, hold up your bank, I bet they've got some coins in their pockets, and if they don't, I'll tell you an even bigger secret. They eat bills, too. <laughs> they love bills. Fives, twenties taste so good. So good. Um, they love those bills. So uh, what I hope you will do um, after church today or maybe throughout the week, remember your coin bank, not just for Flippy and Floppy, but for children, too, other people who are hungry throughout the world. Think you can do it? Yeah! Think you can do it? I think so too. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much that there are some things we can do to make the world a better place. It doesn't have to be a huge problem. We just take little steps, little steps every day. Even coins in our pockets make a difference. So God, help us to remember that. Help us to respond so that the love we find in Christ might come through these banks to the lives of others who are in need. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, gang. Have a great week. The word Hosanna has its roots in the Old Testament phrase, 
Hoshiana, Hoshiana, which may be translated as a plea, save us please, or it may mean save us now, where it almost sounds like a command to God. Today when we sing Hosanna, what kind of king are we hailing? A king whom we expect to always bail us out of trouble? Or a king we are willing to submit to and trust even in those difficult times? Please stand as you are able and let us join together in our prayer of confession. Eternal God, God, in Jesus Jesus Christ, you entered Jerusalem, died for our sins. We confess that we are not able to do the same, but not before you in the world of the grace. For we pray that the faith is in trouble, for enthusiasm that has little depth, for hopes that we pray but do not pursue, have mercy on us. Forgive us, God. And give us such trust in your power that we may live with the courage, trusting in your gospel, and by the name of your grace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Exclaiming Hosanna is a way to praise God. It reminds Christ's followers that He can save us and that He is the completed source of our salvation. At times we may cry Hosanna because we want obstacles or difficulties removed from our path, like the Romans. But Hosanna in worship reminds us that Christ has already defeated our greatest enemy, sin. Rejoice in the good news of the gospel. We are forgiven, saved from sin, and redeemed to God through faith in Jesus Christ, our King. Hosanna! Hoshiana, thanks be to God. Having been assured of Christ's forgiveness and the peace that comes through him, I invite you to share some sign of peace with those around you. One of the ways in which we glorify God is by sharing good news of our church family with God and one another. And we've got some good news to share, beginning with the reception of some fine new members who I will now introduce to you with a sense of joy. In order to accomplish that, I'll ask them to come forward here to the chancel steps at this point in time. I have to see where people line up, I know where to start. (laughs) Okay, I'll begin on uh, closest to me and then go on from there. Jenilyn Riley. Born in Ohio, raised in Michigan, where she developed a deep passion for sports teams from Detroit. After living in Corona and Orange County, where she once worked for the Symphony, Jenilyn moved to our community at the turn of this millennium, and she's taught in Marietta Valley school system ever since. 
She's very close there with her good friend, Ashley Miyake, who invited her to come to church, and so we welcome Jenna here today. We can do that, all right. <laughs> Next, Jim and Paula Fenton, lived, has, they've lived in our community since 1992. He was born in Philadelphia, raised in Illinois and Kentucky, spent 32 years in the U.S. Navy, where he eventually became a captain. Following his retirement from the Navy, he spent several years with Scientific Atlanta before founding his own manufacturing company out here. Paula was born in Minneapolis, raised in Wilmar, Minnesota. After earning her master's degree in nursing, she met Jim at the Naval Hospital in Long Beach. Uh, altogether, she served two decades in the Navy. After moving to this area, they spent several years in the Lutheran Church, where he worked on a building campaign, and she sang in the choir. Together, they have one son, Adam, so we welcome Jim and Paula. Cool. Next, we have the Kreinbrings, uh, recently moved to our community from Hemet, California. Uh, Greg was born in Burbank, raised in Claremont, worked in the warehouse division of ADP for about 30 years. Debbie was born in Wyoming, raised all over the world as the daughter of an Air Force staff sergeant. After leaving home, she worked in operations for Bank of America for a long time before accepting her dream job with Galliano Winery, where she served as business manager for about 20 years. He enjoys gardening, making friends. She enjoys crafting, uh, canning, cruising, and planning special events, including church suppers. We'll remember that. <laughs> so we're thrilled to welcome Greg and Debbie, too. Next, come on around. We got the Heidmans, too. Perfect. So glad both of you could make it today. Uh, this is Craig and Joe Heidman. They were high school sweethearts from Grand Rapids, Mich Michigan. He made his living in the grocery business, most recently with Albertsons. She was a full-time homemaker most of their career. Uh, most of his working years were spent in San Diego County, but he and Joe moved here to Temecula Hills in 2003, where I met him in the swimming pool, swimming laps together. <laughs> Uh, Joe enjoys making cards and ceramics. She already sent a sweet card to my wife this week for her birthday. That's really cool. They were active in the UCC for many years, and so we do welcome Craig and Joe. As I mentioned to all of you, uh, during our time together, we ask each person who wishes to affiliate with our church to answer three important questions. First, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do you? Do you wish to be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Do you? And finally, do you want to be a member of Grace Presbyterian Church? Very good. Having heard that, I'll now ask all our members and friends to please stand for the congregational vows that are made. We, the members of Grace Church, accept Greg, Joe, Paula, Jim, Jenilyn, Craig, and Debbie as new members of our church, do we? We do. we do. Will we pray for them, comfort them, encourage them, and welcome them into the ministries where we serve? Will we? We will. Hearing that, let us pray. Dear God, we do thank you for the blessing of new faces, hands, hearts, and ideas. May your Holy Spirit work within us to build the bonds of friendship and strengthen the ties of faith. Most of all, May the love and grace of Jesus become more evident in each of us with every passing season. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. You may all be seated. Thank you. Very good. I will ask the new members who are able to stay a little while after church with me to stand in the narthex so that you can greet them personally after church today. Moving on to some other reasons to celebrate the love and grace of God, there are many this week that we need to share with you. First, on this Thursday, March 28th, the membership committee of our church will host a meaningful reenactment of Christ's Passover supper at six o'clock in the sanctuary. During the supper, we will explain the Jewish Seder for Passover meals and share several Jewish foods that are served at these festive times. Then the worship committee of our church will host a traditional tenebrae service that begins at 7 p.m. During that ceremony, 
the passion story of Jesus will be read, traditional hymns will be shared, and lights will be gradually extinguished as Christ's life comes to an end. A number of people find that service to be one of the most meaningful of the year. Next, on Saturday, March the 30th, we'll have sort of the opposite uh, experience here because we're going to host a pancake breakfast beginning at 9 a.m., and then an Easter egg hunt beginning at 10 a.m., where children from throughout our community will be released to search for eggs in various parts of the church grounds, separated by age group, so the big ones don't rob the little ones. Uh, and we'll also uh, have some fun activities for kids in the Christian Ed Room. Uh, there's no charge for that event at all. We would love for you and your family to attend. Finally, on next Sunday, March 31st, of course, we're going to celebrate Easter here in the church in several uplifting ways. First, the sanctuary will be decorated with scores of Easter lilies that you can dedicate in honor or memory of a loved one. Those can still be purchased last chance today. Second, the front of the church will also include a floral cross for the very first time, decorated by our children and used in the children's message. I think you'll find that to be beautiful and meaningful. Third, we'll proclaim Christ's resurrection through the sound of a brass quintet that will accompany our chancel choir. There's a lot of joy in that. So it's really going to be a wonderful morning. Uh, might be smart to come a bit early next week uh, to make room for our visitors. And it would also be very kind of you to sit a little bit closer to the front next week. I know that's uncomfortable for some people, but the visitors feel so much better in back. Uh, and so if you did that, that would be nice. Uh, moving on to prayer. Oh, finally, one other thing. Don't forget, one eight, great hour of sharing our traditional Easter offering for the hungry uh, and for those in need throughout the world. Kids are collecting it with food banks, with the coin banks, but you don't have to have a coin bank. Uh, you can simply uh, write a check to OGHS, and that can make such a difference to others who are in need. Moving on to prayer concerns, there are several listed in this morning's bulletin. Don't have time to share all of them today, but we do hope you'll take the bulletin home and use it in your prayer time throughout the week. And with those thoughts in mind, let us pray. Dear God, we are so grateful for your presence with us in every challenge of this life. There is no fear too small and no threat too big to block your love for us. Thus we come to you both in our hopes and fears, trusting you to lead us through them. We remember those who are grieving, comfort them. We remember those who are struggling with physical ailments, ease their sense of pain. We remember those who are carrying emotional burdens Help them cast their cares on you. And remember those who are threatened by problems much bigger than themselves, especially throughout the world by the threat of war. Deliver them from evil. And finally, in all these efforts, Lord, use us as your vessels of mercy, hope, and peace for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior, for it's he who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of God.
Dear God, we do thank you for the oneness that we find in Christ. Gathered as your children, we are one. In this Holy Week, when we remember once again how much Jesus did for us in his last week on the earth, help us live as grateful children, devoted to our Savior, surrounded by his love. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture readings for this morning describe two very different types of adulation, each of which is appropriate for the season. One's easy in many ways, and one's not. But both are a very big part of Christ last week upon the earth. The first story comes to us from the 11th chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, beginning with verse 1. The second from the 14th chapter of Mark's Gospel, beginning with verse 3. As these texts are read, I invite you to listen now for the Word of God to you. As they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples onward, saying, Go into the village ahead of you. Just as you enter it, you will find a colt tethered there, a colt no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their own cloaks over it, he began to ride it. Many other people spread their cloaks upon the road, while still others covered it with branches that they had cut from the fields. Both those who went ahead of him and those who followed him began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. When you get beyond the quirks of this morning's text, especially the unbroken cult, would have been a little tough to ride, this passage is finally about adoration. Both those who've been with Jesus for perhaps three years and those who'd heard of Jesus through others gathered on the road to Jerusalem to welcome him like a victor and a king. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the cost of that adulation was cheap. After all, how much does it cost to cut branches from someone else's lot and lay them on the ground? Nothing. How much does it cost to cheer? Nothing. How much does it cost to lay your cloak for a few minutes on the ground? Maybe a cleaning bill or some soap. How much does it cost to take someone else's colt? I guess that depends on if you get caught. But assuming they had permission to do that in this morning's text, again, the cost of adoration was not high. So Palm Sunday, as memorable and fun as it is to celebrate, was a rather low-budget affair. No jesters, no fireworks, no booty to display. Instead, as Rick alluded to earlier, this victory parade was very humble in some ways. Christ coming not on a war horse, but a colt, a simple little colt. In spite of that low standard, I suspect they enjoyed it. All of them did. That's why it's listed in the Gospels. But what they did not know, perhaps they could not know, is the price that they would pay to be followers of Christ and the price that he would pay on their behalf would be quite shocking before the week was done. Fortunately, one disciple knew that. She knew it very well, and her story is the next one we will see. Later in the week, while Jesus was reclining at table in the home of Simon the leper in Bethany, a woman came to him with an alabaster, alabaster flask of perfume, pure nard, which was very costly. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head, some of those who were present at the gathering began to speak indignantly to one another, saying, why was this ointment wasted? It could have been sold for more than 300 denarii with the money given to the poor. 
Then they rebuked this woman harshly. If you lived in the time of Jesus, no less than four things would be shocking in this passage, however it's translated. First, Christ is eating at the home of a leper. Jews weren't supposed to do that. They weren't supposed to sit with them, much less dine with them. But Jesus did it anyway. Wasn't afraid to sit with them, touch them, eat with them. Not afraid to be in their homes. Second, while he was at supper, a woman who we don't know came forward and began anointing Jesus' head. Women weren't supposed to do that to anyone but their husbands. There are two other Bible studies where women appear to anoint our Savior's feet with oil or tears, much like a household servant might do. But this is the only story where either a woman or a man pours oil on Jesus' head. Third, she didn't just use oil. She used nard. Spike nard is the technical term. It comes from a plant that grows only at high altitudes, very high altitudes, like you might find in the Himalaya Mountains. 3,300 miles from Jerusalem. That's farther than here to Alaska, farther than here to Jamaica. It was a very precious gift. According to this morning's text, one flask, one little flask, might cost 300 denarii. That's about 20,000 bucks in our life today. So this was not cheap perfume. Fourth, she broke it. She broke the flask. She didn't just twist the top off, use a drop or two. She broke the flask, which itself was expensive, and poured every drop of that on top of Jesus' head. Evidently, this type of flask was sealed to prevent contamination. You couldn't use just part. You had to use it all, and she did. In our world, this would be sort of like uncorking a bottle of Dom Perignon or some other elaborate champagne, maybe from 1959. One bottle, one bottle of that year's champagne costs 40,000 bucks. And for most of us, it's crazy, absolutely crazy to spend that kind of money on one bottle, one evening, one night, So it's no wonder the guests scoffed. No wonder they were offended. No wonder they thought this perfume was such a waste. But in this story, as in so many others, Jesus saw it differently. And his insight was so key. Mm -hmm. Jesus said to them, Leave her alone. Why should you bother her? She has done a good deed for me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them whenever you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could about that. She anointed my body beforehand to prepare it for my burial. Truly I say to you that wherever the gospel is proclaimed throughout the world, What she has done will be proclaimed in memory of her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. In order to defend the woman in this passage, Jesus makes three important points. First, he says she did a good thing. A good thing, not a bad one. In spite of all appearances to the contrary, She didn't waste the ointment. She didn't just burn through cash. Instead, she did the one thing that no one else had done throughout his life. She treated him not just as a leader or a role model or a teacher or a friend. She treated him as her Savior, her Messiah, and her King. You see, the Jewish word Messiah means anointed one. You could not hold that role till someone poured a very special oil upon your head. That's why high priests were anointed in a very special way. So were Jewish kings. 
That type of anointing happened once. Just once in a lifetime, usually at the start of a brand new ruler's reign, and no expense was shared. Again, in our world, that would be the day to uncork your Dom Perignon, to break the alabaster jar, to pull out all the stops, to make it great. So in this morning's text, for the first and only moment in his life, Christ was treated as God's anointed one, not at the beginning of his reign, but at the end near the very end. We don't know why the woman did that. Perhaps our Lord had healed her. Perhaps our Lord had saved her in a moment of distress. Perhaps she was a relative of the leper in the household, amazed that Christ had deigned to eat with them. We don't know. But we do know this. To her, he was worth it. He was worth every penny that she spent on that precious nard. He was worth the sort of gift that only kings received. And that's why Jesus tells us that she did well. Her work was good. The second thing that he tells us is that her work was timely. You might say it was done in the very nick of time because when this supper ended, Judas would go out to betray him. His own treasurer would do him in in less than two days. Our Savior would be finished, body broken, spirit crushed, overdone. If he was ever going to be anointed as God's chosen king, this was it. This would be the only day She couldn't prevent his passing, but she did what she could. She anointed him not just for kingship, but for burial. Because of her, Jesus got to smell that precious ointment that was so remarkable and so rare, he got to feel it in his hair. He got to sense her costly love for him. Soon, he would feel thorns upon his head. Soon, his brow would flow, not with ointment, but blood. The blood poured out for you. But at this moment, at this precious point in time, he got to receive the full measure of someone else's love for pulling out all his love in return. She did it in the nick of time. That's the second point that he makes. Here's the third one. He says, her act is worthy of remembrance, not just in Jerusalem or Judea, but everywhere. From one end of this planet to the other, everywhere the word is preached, this woman will be remembered for anointing him with nard. Her name won't be remembered, unfortunately. That part was lost to history, but her gift will be remembered. Because this woman treated Jesus as her Messiah, as her anointed one, on this holy night, even before Simon Peter or any of the twelve, she treated him with the love that he had earned. And she did that with a very costly gift. But what does that mean for us, you and me today? The juxtaposition of these stories, how might we apply them in our lives? There's two ways I'd suggest. First, there is a time for low-cost adulation. Thank God. (laughs) We can worship God with palm fronds. We can worship God with coin banks. We can worship God with stories, songs, and cheers. Hallelujah. Because that means there's no limit. 
No person on this planet who can't worship in some way, regardless of their means or lack of means. There's no time in our lives when worship is restricted and walled off in some way. That's why church is free. There's no admission here. Even when we ask folks to contribute to dinners or events, we make exceptions for those with needs. And the funds we do collect just cover costs. They barely cover costs. This Thursday, for example, couldn't happen unless lots of folks gave many hours for free. But it's worth it. So worth it. To make God's love more accessible to every human being. Because that's finally why we're here. It's finally what we're designed to accomplish to bring that love from here to others. Especially those who are in most need. That's the first point we can glean from this morning's text. Here's the second one. In order to make Christ's love accessible to every human being, some folks must give quite dearly from their essence and their core. When in this morning's text did that with a priceless jar of oil that she poured on Jesus' head to show everyone who he really was. In my experience, that's what it really takes for a church to last, a church to work, people who give deeply from their essence, from their core. Some folks have assets they can give, stocks, bonds, cars, all that sort of thing. Some folks don't. But so many of those give time. Maybe 20 hours a week for free. Holding bulletins, trimming shrubs, sweeping floors, planning lessons, arranging service projects that we do outside. That's the kind of commitment that makes a church endure. Two of those very dear people were Ken and Pat Nordstrom. It was at the heart of every mission project at our church, and she was right there beside him all the time. His greatest gift was to make things fun. He spun records, he told corny jokes, he got people laughing. He was great at that. They also formed an awesome team, not just for our church, but for many other charities, especially those that would do auctions. Pat would sit in the audience, she would be a shill, and he would be tossing out numbers, higher, higher, higher. You know, she'd always try to get somebody else to compete. They'd be laughing about it. They came home with so much garbage at the end. But they were thrilled to do it. Absolutely thrilled because every bit of junk that they collected meant some charity in our city collected more, much more than they ever could have done otherwise. Those of you who've been in church a while know a lot of that story. But just a few of us know another part. A part that will conclude, interestingly enough, this year on Easter Sunday, when every last penny that our lender required us to collect in the honor campaign will be paid in full. It's finished, it's done, but it never would have started. Never would have happened without Ken. When Arlinda first required us to launch this campaign, no one was excited. Because debt reduction campaigns don't have any obvious benefit. There's no beautiful playground, no new building, no anything. It's just your budget looks better. We, you know? I mean, it, it, it's so hard to get enthused about that. But Ken understood it. He understood it very well. So he came to me and said, I'll run it. I'll make it happen. We'll do it all in-house. We'll keep our costs so low. We will solve the problem of this debt. I said, that's great. That's awesome. Our lender didn't. Our lender said, according to our studies, in-house campaigns are usually not successful. They just don't work as well. Therefore, 
you shall hire an outside fundraiser so that whatever funds you collect, you can add another 30 grand on top of that to pay for him. We weren't thrilled by that news. Neither was Ken, but he and Pat prayed about it. Then they came to me and said, we'll pay it. In addition to all the money we were going to give to the original campaign, we'll pay the fundraiser too. We'll do it. We'll make it happen. And they did. Didn't know this was going to happen. Um, but I do know this. The reason we exist, the reason every church continues to exist, is because of Pat, folks like Ken and Pat. They broke the jar. They broke the jar of nard. They did whatever it would take to make church work. And the love of Christ is just so evident in them. Thanks be to God. say, and there's nothing one can give that fully expresses how much Jesus gave to us. But we are fortunate in this world to have some days, some ways, some opportunities to show the depth of our love to him. This week is one of them. So as you go forth from this place, remember the love of him who gave his all for you. Then strive to live in ways that can truly honor him. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Oh